Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com and this is a special surgeon question and answer session all about traditional robotic and transcatheter mitral valve repair surgery. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Joanna Chikwi, who is not just the chair, she's the founding chair of cardiac surgery at the Smith Heart Institute at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Chikwi, are you there? Yes, I am, Adam. Uh, great to see you. Great to see you, Dr. Chikwi. And for the folks out there who may not know you, you are a longtime supporter of heartvalvesurgery.com, and you've performed a lot of successful mitral valve surgery on folks like Joey Nakasawa or Arthur Hill or Patricia Reuter. On behalf of all of us here, thanks for your support over the years. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I think heartvalvesurgery.com is a really phenomenal website, an amazing resource. It's full of really helpful, patient-centered information and feedback. Um, so genuine privilege and a pleasure to be here. Wow, thanks so much for the kind words. It means a lot. And let's get to the topic at hand. And just before we get there though, I wanna ask you a question all about you, Dr. Chikwi. You know, there's a lot of things available to cardiac surgeons out there to focus on, but valve therapy, and we've known each other for a long time, maybe 10 years or so, has always been a big part of your practice. Can you talk about why repairs and replacements are, are so important to you in, in your practice there at Cedars? We do what we love doing. So there's something very special about repairing a mitral valve, repairing an aortic valve or a tricuspid valve. Every single valve is different. It's incredibly creative. It's very demanding. And most importantly, it makes such a profound difference to patients if you can repair it and repair it well, rather than replacing it. And you have repaired and you have replaced lots of valves over your lifetime. And today we're talking about repairs. And so maybe we can start though and just help the patients understand repairs are typically done for mitral regurgitation, correct? That's absolutely correct. And the commonest causes of mitral valve regurgitation, so that's a leaking mitral valve, are uh, your the heart pump may have stretched and it just pulls the mitral valve leaflets apart so they don't kind of come together so well so the valve leaks. That's called functional mitral valve regurgitation. And then the mitral valve regurgitation that is really rewarding to repair because it's one of the things that helps that patient have a normal life expectancy is mitral valve rotation due to a floppy valve. And that's really common. Maybe 7 million Americans walking around with a floppy mitral valve. Dr. Chick, we, we've heard that this disease can often be um, underdiagnosed and undertreated. If people are just hearing about the buzz term mitral regurgitation, what symptoms might they be experiencing, if anything? So I think there are probably five things that you might want to think about. The first one is you may feel nothing. You may feel perfectly fine. Somebody's put a stethoscope on your chest and they've heard what we call a heart murmur. That's probably one of the commonest things that we hear. The next thing is people feel winded when they're doing their normal activity. So you're walking upstairs, suddenly you find yourself having to stop halfway up and catch your breath. You might feel winded in bed at night and feel that you need to sit up to catch your breath or get up and walk around. That's a really important symptom. That makes us worry that you're starting to suffer from heart failure. Feeling palpitations is really common. That can be caused by atrial fibrillation and occasionally chest tightness. And one really common symptom, and I wouldn't tell people to worry about this because we all feel this, but one of the commonest is just fatigue. I feel exhausted all the time. And it's amazing how often after mitral valve surgery, that feeling of fatigue goes away. I never promise that to patients because it's not always their valve, but it's really interesting how that can be a real hallmark sign. Well, and I'm sure the patients are thinking, God, if I could move past those symptoms for a better quality of life. That's what I'm looking for. But life expectancy is a really big question for patients, is if they are to have a mitral valve repair, can they get back to a normal life expectancy? Okay, that is such an important question. And really that's central to the surgical treatment of mitral valve regurgitation. We are all about trying to get a patient back to a normal life expectancy. And if you have a floppy mitral valve that leaks, and you can get that repaired really well before you start having symptoms, that's what's gonna get you a normal life, a normal life expectancy and a normal quality of life. If you wait until you start to feel symptoms or until your heart has started to stretch on an echocardiogram, 
that's already dropping your life expectancy. And if you end up with a valve replacement instead of a valve repair, that really starts to impact your life expectancy. A replacement is better than nothing, but a valve repair done surgically that lasts well, that's the best of all. So there's nothing better than hopefully getting the patients back to a full and normal life expectancy. And Dr. Chickwee, let's talk about how you and your team at Cedar sinai get the patients there. Let's first talk about an access point that you use, which is known as a traditional approach, which is the sternotomy. What happens when you use that approach with patients? The traditional way of doing this around America would be an incision, probably about some places that size. My approach is about that size. Through the middle gives you great access. And all I can say is, and I tell patients this, this hurts so much less than you think. Your nerves come together here. There's a little gap where there's not a lot of nerves. This is a relatively pain-free approach. It's super safe. It's kind of the old gold standard. I've also heard that surgeons can access the mitral valve through the ribs. Is that right? That's absolutely right. So while I would talk about a stenotomy as the old gold standard, for me, the new gold standard is through the ribs. And it's, again, an equally sort of small incision. And the way that we can do that safely and get you a beautiful mitral valve repair is we use a robotic to assist um, us. And the reason that is so important is because instead of me looking at your mitral valve, which is about that size, down a deep dark hole in the distance, I have a huge 3D color screen. Um, I've got beautifully delicate, precise instruments, and that allows me to do a super precise incision and a super precise repair. And the benefit for patients is they have a tiny incision, they're going to recover fast. I think it's pretty similar to a stenotomy, but so many people prefer it. Uh, that sounds uh, really neat, a robot assisting you through a surgery. Um, and now maybe we can talk about what's come from the horizon to reality, which is the trans catheter. How does something like that, how do you access the heart using a catheter? Mitroclip, which is one of the trans catheter options, is a total game changer for many patients with mitral valve disease. I think we have to be really clear though, which patients. So right at the beginning, we talked about functional mitral regurgitation. Your heart muscle has stretched, your valves don't quite meet together, that's why it's leaking. And the mitroclip is a great option because there weren't terrific surgical options for that. Dr. Chickwee, this mitroclip sounds fantastic. Can you explain how you use this technology? So absolutely, but full disclosure, I do not do the mitroclip. That's done at Cedars by interventional cardiologists who do hundreds and really just specialize in that. So if you were a patient having a mitroclip, essentially you're going to spend a couple of hours on a table in a laboratory. They'll get a tiny little catheter into the vein in one of your legs thread that up to the right side of your heart, puncture the little wall that's between the right and the left side of your heart so that it's now in the left side of your heart. And that wire delivers a clip. And the goal of the mitra clip is to, as your leaflets come together with every single heartbeat, that clip is just gonna capture those leaflets as they come together and hold them together. And for some patients, that's enough to prevent regurgitation. Some patients need a second clip um, and that, because it's just a puncture in your groin in one of the veins, allows you to go home within a few hours or occasionally the next day. Wow. So there are, there's no incision to the, to the sternum. There's no incision to the ribs. The, the patient's not even on the heart-lung machine. Uh, it seems like if, if for the right patient, this could be a really good, good solution for them, yeah? You're absolutely right. This is a complete paradigm shift and a game changer for the right patients and the patients with functional MR, the frail patients with leaky mitral valves and definitely the prohibitive risk patients, this is transformative and it remains to be seen and we are all watching intensely, is this also going to be a game changer for those surgical patients that could benefit from surgery. You talked about clipping uh, the leaflets with the mitral clip and I'm real curious to know what other techniques might you use to fix the mitral valve? So that's where this becomes just a joy for a surgeon because you have this spectrum of techniques that you can use to get a really challenging valve back into the shape that it needs to be. So the commonest approach we use is to 
literally do a little triangle that gets rid of the piece of the mitral valve that's floppy, join the edges together, and suddenly the whole thing just sits there looking like a perfect smile again. We bring the whole thing together with a ring because that stabilizes it long term. And oftentimes that's all you need. For patients that have got a couple of extra pieces of floppy valve, often if it's their anterior, it's like the front leaflet, that we can reconstruct with cords that are a bit like parachute cords. Um, and usually when we're in there, if you have atrial fibrillation, we will correct that with a maze procedure and close off a little pocket in the heart called the appendage to reduce your risk of stroke. And so Dr. Chickley, that was my next question, all about the concomitant procedures for patients who have cardiac conditions in addition to valve disease. You mentioned AFib. What else can you do during an um, operation on the valves? So atrial fibrillation is really important. We used to regard it as a sort of benign arrhythmia, and we know it isn't. It causes stroke, it reduces life expectancy. So in any patient that has a history of atrial fibrillation, we would want them to leave the operating room with a procedure to correct that. And part of that is closing off this little pocket that I referred to, the left atrial appendage. Other things that we do at the same time as mitral valve surgery when we're doing it through the side are fixing a tricuspid valve, that's like the mirror image of your mitral valve, but on the right side of your heart. And oftentimes that's a little bit stretched, it leaks, and we can fix that very easily with a ring. And then the other piece of the jigsaw is the little wall between those two right and left sided chambers that often has a hole called a PFO. And we can close that at the same time, very straightforward. If we're going through a stenotomy, and sometimes it's the reason to choose a stenotomy, other operations we can do at the same time are coronary bypasses and aortic valve surgery. Those would be the commonest. Yeah, Dr. Chikwe, you've talked about a lot of technology today. You talked about uh, robots. You talked about catheters clipping leaflets together. What do you see as the future? That's a really exciting question. And I genuinely see the future as a continued focus on getting less and less and less invasive. So you're going through smaller incisions, but achieving the same excellent long-term results. This is not about compromising the quality of the result for the patient in the short term or the long term. Um, I think some of the really exciting things uh, involve going through little punctures and tiny incisions in the front of the chest and placing those parachute cords without stopping the heart. That's a wonderful way to fix prolapse. And I intuitively feel that's a superior way to fixing prolapse than trying to clip two leaflets together. But essentially what will tell us is a randomized trial. And one of the exciting things in this area right now is there are two, three, four randomized trials comparing mitroclips and punctures through veins to surgical approaches for repairing the valve. And that will tell us what's the right answer for each individual patient that has this problem. So Dr. Chickley, with all these techniques available for mitral valve repair, I'm sure the patients are wondering, can I just choose one technique over the other? That's a really important question. And for patients that are low risk, you're young, you're in your 60s, you've got nothing wrong with you. Right now, the best option for you is mitral valve repair done surgically. And the key thing that you're doing is choosing the surgeon that can deliver you the safest and best repair. Then there's a group of patients that are older, maybe a little bit more wrong with their heart. We call those intermediate risk. The only way that you should be getting a mitral clip at this point in time is through one of those trials, because genuinely, it's not clear that a mitral clip will give you that good long-term outcome. And then there's a population of patients that are so sick, so they're very elderly, they're very frail, and they would have a high chance of having a bad outcome with surgery. We call that prohibitive risk. And those patients are probably best suited to a mitral clip, and that's the only, um, indication for a mitral clip right now for floppy mitral valve disease. So in summary, it's a really careful discussion with your cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon and making the best choice with all of the information that's tailored to you and not just through Dr. Google. Yeah, Dr. Google, I've not, I've not heard that before, but you bring up so many great points right there, which is it's um, this uh, heart team approach and bringing the patient into the decision-making process uh, along with the criteria that you so you and your team have been working on in teams around the country, around the world to get the best results for the patients. I've got to ask you as we wrap up here, one of the most important questions for any patient 
going through this process, I'm sure they're always collecting advice from leading clinicians like yourself. What advice do you have for a patient out there who might be considering a mitral valve repair right now? I think it's essential that you do your research and I think it's essential that you partner with your cardiologist who has a really good understanding of the surgeons that have the expertise to give you the best outcome. One question that you should take to every visit and every consultation with a surgeon is a very simple one. It's about how many repairs have you done successfully in patients that look like me with my valve anatomy. And you want that number to be in the hundreds and you want the chances, the percentage chance of you having a mitral valve repair successfully for your mitral valve prolapse to be well above 95, 99%. Um, that's essential. It's very difficult to get that information just by going through Google. And that's really why partnering with your cardiologist is essential. Talking to colleagues, going online, websites like heartvalvesurgery.com, that will give you a really great insight. At CEDARS, uh, we pride ourselves, over a thousand robotic mitral repairs, um, well over a 99.9% .9 repair rate. And Dr. Chikwe, I can't thank you enough for sharing that so um, succinctly for our patients, because I know as a patient how challenging it can be when you're in the office with a clinician and you forget the important questions. And so I hope everybody takes a moment to write down the, the questions that Dr. Chickwe just laid out, because it really can make a big difference in who you decide to select for your procedure. And on that wonderful note, Dr. Chickwe, I cannot thank you enough for your ongoing support of heartvalvesurgery.com and more importantly, your pursuit of wonderfully functioning hearts and heart valves. Uh, you've been an incredible resource over the years. And on behalf of all of our community, I just want to say thank you and your team at Cedars. Thank you so much, Adam. I really appreciate that. It's a genuine pleasure to join you today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.